All right, here we are uh, for Jonah, Jonah for beginners, the book of Jonah for beginners, uh, the good and bad of Jonah. This is a two part uh, series. We're going to cover the entire uh, book itself. And uh, first thing I want to say about Jonah is that I believe uh, one of the most familiar stories um, and books used for VBS. Everybody has VBS. All types of churches use a VBS program, Vacation Bible School. And um, uh, Jonah is uh, usually one of the characters used in their VBS, probably because the idea of someone being swallowed by a great fish and living in the belly of that fish for three days captures the imagination of, uh, of everyone, but young people, especially of every age. Uh, now, if we're going to talk about Jonah, a little background here. Jonah, of course, was a real person, not just some Old Testament parable, as some uh, believe. He was uh, a historical figure. His name meant dove, a dove. And we know that he's a historical figure because in the Bible itself, uh, in chapter one, verse one, it says that he was the son of Amittai. And this same Jonah, son of Amittai, is mentioned in 2 Kings, chapter 14, 23 to 27. So if, if, if it's just a parable, uh, usually you don't get that kind of background information. Uh, so Jonah is not a parable, is not a, a mythical character, but a real character in the Bible. 2 Kings tells us that he was a prophet in the northern kingdom of Jeroboam II, who lived in the eighth century before Christ. However, it's, uh, it's the book of Jonah that describes an important event in his life, which revealed both a great gift and several weaknesses in this prophet's life. That's why the subheading of this uh, short series is the good and bad of Jonah. There was good and there was bad in Jonah's life and we're going to take a look at that. So let's open our Bibles and study both facets of this man's life to see if we can learn something about ourselves uh, through him and uh, his uh, experience. First of all, we're going to talk about Jonah's gift, the good of uh, Jonah. And we'll begin reading in chapter one, verses one to 10. Read along with me, please. The word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, go to Nineveh, the great city, and cry against it, for their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah rose up to flee to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. So he went down to Joppa, found a ship which was going to Tarshish, paid the fare, and went down into it to go with them to Tarshish from the presence of the Lord. The Lord hurled a great wind on the sea and there was a great storm on the sea so that the ship was about to break up. Then the sailors became afraid and every man cried to his God and they threw the cargo which was in the ship into the sea to lighten it for them. But Jonah had gone below into the hold of the ship, laying down and fallen sound asleep. So the captain approached him and said, how is it you are sleeping? Get up, call on your God. Perhaps your God will be concerned about us so that we will not perish. Each man said to his mate, come, let us cast lots so we may learn on whose account this calamity has struck us. So they cast lots and the lot fell on Jonah. Then they said to him, tell us now, on whose account has this calamity struck us? What is your occupation and where do you come from? What is your country? From what people are you? And he said to them, I'm a Hebrew and I fear the Lord God of heaven who made the sea and the dry land. Then the men became extremely frightened and they said to him, how could you do this? For the men knew that he was fleeing from the presence of the Lord because he had told him. So note that the story explains itself, but within the story, we discover a man who had a great gift and that was the gift of prophecy. Now the gift of prophecy expressed itself in several ways. And the book of Jonah demonstrates that Jonah possessed this particular gift in all of its forms. For example, there is prophecy in the form of 
powerful preaching. One of the abilities of someone uh, who has the gift of prophecy is that he uh, can preach uh, powerfully. Uh, we are told in verse two that we read, we are told that God uh, sends Jonah to use his gift, his ability at a certain place, the city of Nineveh, and for a specific purpose to call them to repentance. And so the gift that he has is assumed. He knows he has the gift. He merely receives instructions on where he is to use it, uh, instructions from the Lord. And then in verse 10, Jonah refuses to do God's will, but despite this, we get a glimpse of his ability as he shares his faith with the men on board the ship. Now these men were pagans. They were ready to worship anything. They were ready to do anything just to get out of trouble. But the word says that they actually believed Jonah simply through hearing him speak to them. Now, not only did they believe him, they were ready to follow his instructions. And so from this, we gather that his ability was evident, even, even when it wasn't used in context, even when Jonah disobeys God, he couldn't hide the fact that he was a powerful preacher because just speaking to the, to the pagans about the situation that they were all in makes believers out of them, moves them to follow his instructions. Now, another form of this particular gift, aside from powerful preaching, was precise prediction, verses 11 to 16. Another facet, as I say, of this gift uh, in those times was the ability to accurately predict the future. As a matter of fact, most time when we talk about prophecy, people think of this particular uh, ability, the ability to, to predict events in the future. And we don't always think about the ability to have you know, to powerful preaching. But of course, precise prediction uh, is also part of the prophetic gift. Now, uh, today, of course, anybody with a website can set themselves up as a psychic and uh, people, they applaud if, if a modern day prophet is right maybe two out of four times. But in the Old Testament, the true gift of prophecy was confirmed if all of the predictions were fulfilled 100% of the time. Any margin of error resulted in death. So it sort of cut down on you know, false prophets. So let's read 11 to 15, uh, where they talk about this. So they, the, uh, the, the sailors, so they said to him, what should we do to you that the sea may become calm for us? For the sea was becoming increasingly stormy. He said to them, pick me up and throw me into the sea. Then the sea will become calm for you. For I know that on account of me, this great storm has come upon you. However, the men rowed desperately to return to land, but they could not, for the sea was becoming even stormier um, against them. Then they called on the Lord and said, we earnestly pray, O Lord, do not let us perish on account of this man's life and do not put innocent blood on us. For you, O Lord, have done as you have pleased. So they picked up Jonah, threw him into the sea, and the sea stopped its raging. So we see that despite the terrible circumstances and consequences to Jonah, his prediction about the solution to the problem was accurate. It was a, it was a prophecy. It was a prediction about something that would happen in the future, something very unlikely. Uh, and yet it came, it came about to be true. He said, uh, I'll tell you how to calm the sea, just throw me in it and the sea will, the sea will be calm. There's no, ra there's no that, that's not rational, that's not logical, doesn't make any sense. But uh, Jonah told him, if you do this, this is what's going to happen. You know, if it's prophecy, if you talk about something that will happen in an hour from now and it happens, or in a year from now and it happens, because we don't know the future. We don't even know the future five minutes from now, all right? And so in verse 16, we read, 
Then the men feared the Lord greatly and they offered a sacrifice to the Lord and made vows. So the writer describes the attitude and the actions of the survivors on the ship. In their worship and, uh, and change, uh, they confirm the gift that Jonah had and, and, and they recognize it. They see the sign, they worship the God that had been preached to them or spoken to them, uh, uh, the God of Jonah, and they offer true repentance as a sign of their sincere faith. Even in disobedience, the word of the Lord does not return, uh, does not return void. And we see that right here uh, with Jonah and these pagan uh, sailors. Uh, so I said there were three facets, right? So the third facet is uh, for the gift of prophecy, powerful preaching, precise prediction, and the third one is poetic prayer, poetic prayer. We're going to read first the prayer that Jonah makes uh, beginning in verse 17. And it says, and the Lord appointed a great fish to swallow Jonah and Jonah was in the stomach of the fish three days and three nights. Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the stomach of the fish and he said, I called out of my distress to the Lord and he answered me. I cried for help from the depths of Sheol. You heard my voice, for you had cast me into the deep, into the heart of the seas, and the current engulfed me. All your breakers and billows passed over me. So I said, I have been expelled from your sight. Nevertheless, I will look again toward your holy temple. Water encompassed me to the point of death. The great deep engulfed me. Weeds were wrapped around my head. I descended to the roots of the mountains. The earth with its bars was around me forever, but you have brought up my life from the pit, O Lord, my God. While I was fainting away, I remembered the Lord and my prayer came uh, to you into your holy temple. Those who regard vain idols forsake their faithfulness, but I will sacrifice to you with the voice of thanksgiving. That which I have vowed, I will pay. Salvation is from the Lord. Then the Lord commanded the fish and it vomited Jonah up onto the dry land. So Jonah expresses his plight and its solution. He's in an impossible situation. Basically he's buried alive. You know, that's what he means when he says he's in the depth of Sheol. Sheol, the place, the underworld. Uh, the only recourse is to cry out to God because in his present physical condition, God is truly the only one who could actually hear him. And so he looks at his surroundings and he compares it to the times that he worshiped the Lord in Jerusalem at the temple and how sweet and how marvelous that was. He has no offering of animals, no money to make a vow, but he realizes that he can offer other things that are more precious. Even though he's in the belly of the fish, uh, he can offer praise to God. Even though he's in the belly of the fish, he can offer thanksgiving to God. Even though he's in the belly of the fish, he can offer his faith that God can save him. And of course, uh, he realizes that he can offer repentance and a promise of obedience. All of these things uh, more precious uh, than offering an animal or, or offering money or incense or any other type of sacrifice. These are the things that God is looking for. Uh, a sincere praise and thanksgiving, an offer of faith, and of course, repentance when it is needed and a promise of uh, obedience. So from inside the belly of the fish, Jonah realizes not only that God will hear him, but also that what God wants from man is always inside of man and does not require you know, a fancy building or a ceremony uh, to give uh, to God. And so once he realizes this, once he responds to this, he is released from the fish uh, and he is released a changed man ready to use his gift in the proper way. Now, 
the amazing thing here is not only that Jonah learned these things, but that he expressed them so eloquently in these few verses. One aspect of prophecy is uh, the uh, ability to express in beautiful language the mind and the will of God. One will not find more beautiful poetry and powerful images in the Bible than are contained uh, in Jonah's, uh, Jonah's prayer. And so in the first uh, two chapters, we're introduced to a man who possesses the gift of prophecy in all of its many expressions powerful preaching, precise prediction, and a poetic prayer. Now in chapter three, we see how this gift was used in context and how effective Jonah was in his role as a prophet. So let's go to chapter three and begin reading from verse one. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah the second time saying, arise, Go to Nineveh, the great city, and proclaim to it the proclamation which I am going to tell you. So Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three days walk. Then Jonah began to go through the city one day's walk, and he cried out and said, yet 40 days and Nineveh will be overthrown. Then the people of Nineveh believed in God and they called a fast and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. When the word reached the king of Nineveh, he arose from his throne, laid aside his robe from him, covered himself with sackcloth and sat on the ashes. He issued a proclamation and it said, in Nineveh by the decree of the king and his nobles, do not let man, beast, herd or flock taste a thing. Do not let them eat or drink water but both man and beast must be covered with sackcloth and let men call on God earnestly that each may turn from his wicked way and from the violence which is in his hands. Who knows, God may turn and relent and withdraw his burning anger so that we will not perish. When God saw their deeds, that they turned from their wicked way, then God relented concerning the calamity which he had declared he would bring upon them and he did not do it. So uh, again, the chapter is self-explanatory. Jonah uh, you know, goes to Nineveh and he warns them to repent or else they'll be destroyed. Now the writer describes the complete change of heart from the king all the way down to the least of the citizens in the city. And as a result of Jonah's preaching, and their response to it, God spares the city. It's interesting, it says, you know, the city, it was a great city. Actually, it was the largest city of its era at that time. Uh, Nineveh was the, the greatest city of that, of that era. And it says it was a three day walk. That doesn't mean it took three days to walk to Nineveh. It means if you started at one end of Nineveh, it would take you three days to cross the city uh, by walking. However, uh, Jonah begins and he preaches and on the first day of his preaching, the repentance takes place, which uh, signals the power, of his, the power of his preaching. We only have the summary of a few words of the message that he was uh, delivering to the people, repent or else God will, will, uh, will punish you. Uh, but uh, we see how powerful his preaching is because he doesn't have to go three days across the city. Just the first day of his preaching, the news gets to the king, the king repents, the people repent, the city is spared. Now, the story could have ended right here and we would have a marvelous story with a good lesson about repentance and God's love. You know, we would have the fish story about him being in the belly of the fish, all neat, all clean. You know, we could stop right here. But there's another chapter that goes on to describe Jonah's faults. Remember we said the subheading of this, uh, you know, Jonah for beginners, the good and the bad of Jonah. We've been now talking about the good of Jonah the gift that he had and how he exercised it and how effective it was when he exercised the gift that, uh, that God gave him. 
but there are other faults uh, that he has, and we read about those in chapter four. So let's go to chapter four and begin reading. But it greatly displeased Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, please Lord, was not this what I said while I was still in my own country? Therefore, in order to forestall this, I fled to Tarshish, for I knew that you are a gracious and compassionate God, slow to anger and abundant in loving kindness, and one who relents concerning calamity. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for death is better to me than life. The Lord said, do you have a good reason to be angry? Then Jonah went out from the city and sat east of it. There he made a shelter for himself and sat under it in the shade until he could see what would happen in the city. So the Lord God appointed a plant and it grew up over Jonah to be a shade over his head to deliver him from his discomfort. And Jonah was extremely happy about the plant. But God appointed a worm when dawn came the next day and it attacked the plant and it withered. When the sun came up, God appointed a scorching east wind and the sun beat down on Jonah's head so that he became faint and begged with all of his soul to die, saying, death is better to me than uh, life. Then God said to Jonah, do you have good reason to be angry about the plant? And he said, I have good reason to be angry even to death. Then the Lord said, you had compassion on the plant for which you did not work and which you did not cause to grow, which came up overnight and perished overnight. Should I not have compassion on Nineveh, the great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know the difference between their right and left hand, as well as many animals? And so at first, Jonah runs away from God and we could conclude that he was just afraid. And after the fish experience, he gained courage but this would, this would be inaccurate. Jonah was not afraid. We know this for several reasons. First of all, he didn't deny his faith in front of the pagans who were hostile to him. Secondly, he offered himself to be thrown overboard. That doesn't, like, that doesn't sound like somebody who's you know, frightened or easily frightened. Thirdly, he didn't panic when he was swallowed by the fish. You don't hear him scream out and uh, you know, panic and thrash about. He actually begins to pray. And he went to Nineveh and preached against it after all. Nineveh was a, a traditional enemy of the, uh, of the Jews. No, his faults are made evident after he has finished preaching. It's after he's finished preaching that we begin to see what his faults are. For example, one of his faults, he was prejudiced in verse one and two. Some think that anger or impulsiveness, his anger and impulsiveness were the problems, but the anger was the result of the true problem, which was prejudice. He was upset because God spared Jonah's non-Jewish enemies. I mean, these, these Assyrians, these pagans were a thorn in the side of the Jewish nation. And here was a chance to wipe them out and God saves them. I mean, here we are, God is about to wipe out a nation that has caused so much trouble uh, to the Jews. And what does God do? He offers an opportunity for them to be saved. Jonah explains that he ran away because he knew God would forgive them if they repented. And he didn't want uh, to be the one who offered them the chance uh, to be saved. As far as he was concerned, uh, they could, uh, they should uh, die in their sins. And so he was prejudiced and even God's acceptance of these people uh, couldn't force Jonah to accept them, imagine. God says, I, I accept them, I'll, I'll forgive them. Uh, I'll, I'll bring them to safety. And, and Jonah does not want to take part in a mission uh, whose goal uh, is to save uh, his, uh, his enemies. Uh, another fault, another weakness of uh, Jonah, uh, he was presumptuous. 
He was uh, presumptuous in verses uh, three and four. In other words, he assumed that he knew better than God. Now uh, that they were spared, uh, now that there would be no chance of defeating them, now that uh, they might have to actually deal with them as brothers, you know, uh, you know Jonah is thinking, wow, never mind that they're going to be saved. I, I may have to be kind to them. I may have to have fellowship with these people. Uh, of course, uh, history shows that uh, the Ninevites, the Assyrians, eventually lost the war with the north and, and Nineveh was destroyed as their uh, repentance and the, their safety died away. For a moment in time, they were safe. For a moment in time, you know, they, they saw clearly. Uh, they had a, a clarifying moment through the, uh, the preaching of, uh, of uh, Jonah but it didn't, it didn't last for, for very long. Of course, Jonah didn't know this. Jonah wanted to dictate to God what God should do with his life and also the life of the, uh, the nation. And God appeals to him, tries to reason with him. Really, do you want me to, uh, you know, when he says 120,000 people who don't know the right hand from the left, uh, that's talking about minors, you know, uh, uh, children. Uh, who, who have not reached the age of accountability yet. There, were, there weren't just 120,000 people. He said there's, there's uh, 120,000 children there in addition to their parents and, and to livestock. You want me to destroy all of that because you're, because you're angry? And then a third, um, a third uh, fault, if you wish, the good and bad, no way to say it other than to say he was pigheaded, wasn't he? He was, he was pigheaded, uh, verse uh, five to 11. He, he refused to acknowledge that God was the God of all people. He didn't see that the same God who offered him refuge in the plant also offered salvation to this entire city. He refused to believe his own preaching that God spared those who repented and called on him for forgiveness. I mean, think for a moment, Jonah's own experience, God forgave him. God saved him from the belly of the fish. God sends him to Nineveh and now he's angry that God wants to do the same thing for them as a group that he did for Noah, uh, Noah for Jonah. Um, when he was the one uh, who was in trouble. You know, Jonah accepted all of this forgiveness and grace for himself, but he was reluctant to extend that same grace to his enemies. So in the end, his faults canceled out his gifts, rendering him unable to share in the rewards of his uh, preaching. You know, I, I think this is why the story, this uh, story ends abruptly with no closure uh, because this reflects exactly where Jonah was in his spirit. Uh, he, there was no closure. You know, we, we, we want closure, don't we? We're watching a movie, a movie. We want the story to end and we want all the, the storylines to be tied down and solved. You know, we want closure. We feel better. The book of Jonah is difficult because there is no closure. It just stops. And I think it stops like that because that was the reality of what was taking place. And I think sometimes this book teaches us about our lives. Sometimes things happen in our lives and there is no closure. Something just remains open, is not resolved. And in those moments, we have, to, we have to trust God. All right, so we're going to stop here. Uh, and in our next lesson, uh, we're going to draw some life lessons from uh, Jonah's experience. Lessons that can be applied to the Jews and lessons that could be applied to us today in the modern era. So you uh, stay with us. We'll come back and finish up the book of Jonah, the good and bad of Jonah. And, uh, We'll see you next time for part two.